Thank you, Ambassador Wong, for your kind introduction. It's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to come to this uh, prestigious audience to talk about a very important initiative from Xi Jinping, from President Xi Jinping. Uh, October, no, September 7, 2013, President Xi Jinping visit Kazakhstan. He made a speech at uh, Nazarbayev University. In his speech, he proposed to build an economic belt of the new Silk Road. About a month later, October 3rd, he visited Indonesia. Before Indonesia parliament, he made another speech and they, he proposed to build a new maritime silk road. This is uh, the first initiative of such amplitude from China. China has ever put forward. I'm told this, initi this initiative concerns roughly 65 countries, 4.4 4 .4 billion people. An initiative of such a magnitude is uh, unprecedented in China's diplomatic history. To understand this initiative, we need to have a closer look at the world, at China, at this initiative itself. Let me start my first part of the world. The world is undergoing big changes. In the last two years, I went to about 20 different Chinese universities. I went there to give a lecture about international relations. Sometimes I start my lecture by asking this question to the students. I said, look, the world is undergoing deep changes. Tell me, what's the most important change? Then students answer my questions, my, my question. Some say, most important change is uh, globalization. Others say, it's IT revolution. Others say, it's the uh, rise of the BRIC countries. So I say, look, these changes you just mentioned are important. But to my understanding, they are not the most important change. What's the most important change in the international relations? I believe that's the theme change. Every particular historical period has a theme. Last century, for the most part of the last century, the theme was war and the revolution. The theme indicated the way to resolve the major problems facing the world. So last century, witness two bloodiest wars, two world wars, many revolutions, many regional wars. That was the theme of the last century for most part, war and the revolution. 
theme of any particular historical period may change. After the Second World War, gradually theme changed from war and the revolution to peace and development. This is, to my understanding, the most important change. With the theme change, a lot of the change follows suit. For instance, in Europe, you know in my long diplomatic career, I spent 15 years in Europe. After Second World War, you know, Europeans learned lesson from these bloodiest wars. French and the German, they talk to each other. They decide to find a way to avoid war. They start European communities, then European Union. This is, I mean, very important innovation because with the European Union today, the war is long, no longer possible between France and Germany. This is a remarkable achievement. People learned their lessons from war. Then the rise of the emerging countries, especially in Asia. After the Second World War, the Asia has been rising. It has been rising through five waves. First wave, Japan. Second wave, four Asian tigers. Singapore, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Third wave, some ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, etc. Fourth wave, China. Fifth wave, India. This is amazing. Looking around the world, only in Asia, the countries have been rising wave upon wave. It's remarkable. Asia has been rising. This is a very important change which drives the center of gravity of international relations from the Atlantic to the Pacific. This process is far from being over. It will take decades before it, has been, it will be completed. Then the third change we are seeing fastest creation of wealth around the world. Let me give you a few figures. Theme change of our time has been completed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1991, Soviet Union collapsed. In 1991, global GDP amounted to 23 trillion US dollars. In 2013, it jumped up to 71 trillion US dollars. It's remarkable. In 1991, Global trade amounted to only four trillion US dollars. 2013, 38 trillion US dollars. I can go on and on. You see, theme change is leading to big changes. Also, we are seeing the population growth. So today we have 7.2 billion people. Very soon, we'll have 9 million people. The coin has two sides. With such a gro strong growth, 
uh, such, I mean, a, a develop, amazing development, we are seeing also environmental degradation, uh, resource scarcity, the, the earth, the climate change, many, cha many challenges uh, come about. We have to deal with these changes. But the theme change of our time paves the way for a major progress of the humanity. Again, against such a backdrop, we can see in the world today there are two mega trends. The first mega trend stands for the peace development, cooperation, and the win-win. This mega trend comes from the theme change. Behind this mega trend, there are two kind of forces. One is economic interdependence. Two common challenges facing the world. You see climate change, terrorism, pandemics, drug, drug trafficking, etc., etc. No country, no matter how powerful, is able to cope with these challenges alone. Humanity is bound to unite to meet these challenges for their survival. This trend, this mega trend, represents the future. As far as China is concerned, we stand for this mega trend. Since the world today is coming from past, I mean the world of war, revolution, conflict, etc., there's another mega trend which stands for conflict confrontation, hatred, etc., etc. There are also two kind of forces be behind this mega trend. One is uh, vested interest groups. They can profit, they can gain a lot from conflict, from limited war, from confrontation, from hatred. We know who are they, who they are. Another kind of forces is uh, inertia. The world changed, but the people's mindset uh, stays behind. People view everything still in terms of the zero-sum game. I win, you lose. That can be inertia. We should not underestimate it. So two mega trends are competing there. I believe that in the 21st century, the competition of these two trends, mega trends, will decide the destiny of mankind. As far as China is concerned, the reason, big reason behind this initiative, we like to contribute to the first mega trend, which stands for the peace, development, cooperation, and win-win. Now I come to the second part of my talk, China. October last year, I went to New York. I had a luncheon with uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, it's an old friend because I went to U.S. November 1971. In my career, I spent 10 years in U.S. So we, over the luncheon, we discussed about his new book, World Order. And he told me this, he said, Ambassador Wu, I believe that China's rise is the, the most important change in 21st century, uh, he's right. China is rising. 
no matter you like it or not. If you look around the world, about the China's rise, some are cheerful, others are fearful. China is such a large country, almost 1.4 billion people. In the history, in the human history, never we have seen the rise of such a large country, 1.4 billion people. Certainly, the rise of China makes some people uneasy. This is uh, the challenge we Chinese have to, to meet. How to meet this challenge? Certainly, Chinese leaders, different generations, they keep saying that China will stick to the peaceful rise strategy. From Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, they are all saying that. This is very important. Statement from leaders is very important. Then, with these words, people still feel uneasy. They are not sure whether with the rise, I mean rising power of China, what will China do? I believe that the deeds, the facts, speak louder than words. One Belt and One Road Initiative, I mean, is designed to meet that challenge. Now I'm coming to the third part of my talk, One Belt and One Road Initiative. Why China at this stage put forward this initiative. I believe we have taken account of the world need, Asia's reality, and the China's situation. World's need. If we look around the world, three features come to my mind. One, the epicenter of turbulence, of raging war, of conflict, of hatred, is located in Middle East and North Africa. So many problems. We Chinese have a great deal of sympathy for the people of this region. As far as I can see, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see the end of the turbulence in yeah, this region. And this epicenter of conflict is attracts a lot of attention from international community, from major powers. Second feature, which is uh, epicenter of the global financial crisis is located in Europe. We all know that 2008 broke out this uh, financial crisis, first in the U.S., but the later on, with the worsening sovereign debt crisis, the epicenter of this crisis is moved into Europe. Today, Europeans are still struggling with this uh, crisis. They are doing whatever they can to overcome the consequences of this crisis. This fact is there. European leaders are forced uh, inward looking uh, to put their house in order. This is a top priority. Then the third feature which comes to my mind 
East Asia, especially East Asia, is global growth center. In last three or four decades, East Asia witnessed robust and steady growth. East Asia has become the fastest growing and the vibrant region of the world. The growth in the East Asia usually means the double of the average global growth. East Asia's growth is needed not only by Asians, but also by the rest of the world. U.S. needs it, Europe needs it, Africa needs it, Latin America needs it. If that's true, means what? When Asian, East Asian countries, they value very much this status as global growth center. They will do everything they can to preserve that kind of status as a global growth center. Two, international community, major powers, they are, they are interested in keeping East Asia as a global growth center. They need that. Three, the international environment facing East Asia is good for their growth. So this East Asia is, uh, keeps that kind of status it's good for everybody. Then we look at uh, South Asia. South Asia, Asia, Asia is catching up. It's good news for everybody. Then we look at the Central Asia. Central Asia lags behind. East Asia population, 2.2 billion people. Very powerful engine. South Asia, 1.6 billion people. Central Asia, 100 million people. One belt, one row initiative is designed to link East Asia, South Asia, Central Asia together because the economies of these three regions are highly complementary. If this initiative succeeds, means what? That will provide Asia with a powerful engine for further growth. That's the good news, not only for Asian, but for entire international community. China. China, after 36 years of strong growth, we are facing many challenges. From international community, people say, look, Chuck, China today, you are second largest economy in the world. You have to provide them public goods. This initiative is designed to provide public goods. I think one belt, one road initiative is the line for that purpose. AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, it's designed for that purpose. Silk Road Fund is also designed for that purpose. We Chinese, we believe it's time for us to provide some public goods for the stability and prosperity of Asia to do our duty. But how to implement this initiative? 
President Xi Jinping suggests three together. <laughs> First together, let's discuss together. China, I mean, countries along the Silk Road, along the Maritime Silk Road, let's sit down, discuss together to see each other's needs, to identify possible projects of the cooperation uh, on the basis of the mutual benefit. This is the first together. Second together, let's build, let's develop these projects together. Because China alone, we are not able to do it. We, ha we have to do it together uh, on the basis of uh, common interests. The third together, let's benefit from the fruits of these projects. Uh, let's share in the benefits. I think the three together indicates the way which may lead this initi initiative to the success. I, I stop there. I'm ready to take the questions. Thank you very much.